So it's going to be almost a year since uh, the war in Gaza began between Israel and Hamas, of course, launched on the back of the deadly October 7 terror strikes. But more than that, in the last week or so, we are seeing virtually almost like a second front open between Israel and Hezbollah. So what is really going on in that region and what is really the end game here? Because the world cannot afford, let alone one war, now we have two. Uh, joining us now is a very special guest, uh, Ruben Azar, is the new Israeli ambassador to India. Thank you very much for speaking with us here on CNN News 18. Thank you, Zaka, for this invitation. So let me start off with the overview of what's happening uh, in your country, in your region. Uh, so October 7th was one of the most catastrophic events that happened in Israel, in Israel's history. In response to it, the government there launched an operation. It's going to be almost a year now since that. Uh, according to the health ministry in Gaza, 40,000 casualties in this war so far. Uh, how do you speak to the criticism from the international community that this has gone on for too long and for far too much? Well, Zaka, we are uh, facing a new type of warfare. You know, in the past, we used to have either conventional armies or terrorist organizations. We are dealing here with uh, uh, a terrorist organization that actually acquired the capabilities of an army. And not only that, that he has created by breaching any norm known to humanity. It created a situation which it uh, manipulates um, our respect for international law in order to embed themselves within civilian population, in schools operating from hospitals, using ambulances to transfer terrorists. And is a very dense, uh, a very dense uh, urban warfare with hundreds of kilometers of, of uh, tunnels. But fortunately, what I can tell you is that we've been able to defeat the military capabilities of Hamas. Hamas no longer poses a threat at this point on Israel itself. It cannot uh, shoot missiles in great quantity. Their army has been uh, uh, defeated. 15,000 terrorists have been killed by us. Uh, their factories of missiles have been destroyed, hundreds of kilometers of... Uh, so are you saying Hamas does not have the capability to now launch another October 7th? No. Uh, because we have completely dismantled their military organization and we have taken over also their lifeline mm -hmm. of contraband of weapons through the Sinai. So we control the border between uh, Gaza and Egypt and we are still left with a very difficult dilemma that, ha that uh, has to do with our hostages. We've managed to bring back mm -hmm. 150 hostages and we are still with 101 hostages in the hands of Hamas. That uh, is very difficult for us uh, because our society uh, is suffering, our families, and we are doing whatever we can to bring them back. So Either the through a deal. Go back to the point that you were yeah. making. If you are saying that Hamas's capability to launch another October 7th style attack is over, you don't think Hamas can do that, why is this war continuing? Because, first of all, we want to bring our hostages back. Mm -hmm. And second, we want to make sure that Hamas cannot regroup and rebuild its army of terror. Uh, so you, do you reckon the ability to bring back the hostages is better served with the war continuing or finding a ceasefire? Well, as you know, we have adopted the path that was proposed by our prime minister, actually, and adopted by the president of the United States and by the United Nations Security Council that talks about uh, three phases. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have failed to reach the first phase and uh, you don't have to trust us. You can trust uh, the spokesperson of the White House saying that the sole responsible entity for uh, failing to get into the ceasefire is Hamas because Hamas actually is not interested in trading people or in trading, uh, exchanging uh, prisoners. They, what they want to achieve is to remain in power in order to relaunch attacks in the future. So we have to see how we can overcome that. We are still uh, attacking those attempts of Hamas to reorganize themselves in the Gaza mm -hmm. Strip. And we are going to continue to put pressure in order to get either a deal that will bring hostages back home or continuing military operation to take our hostages back like we but did, ma uh, many have been critical year. of Prime Minister Netanyahu, saying that he's the one who's the impediment to the ceasefire. He's the one who does not want a ceasefire done. Well, there was uh, there was some criticism. That's right. But uh, you know, this criticism d does not dispute the fact that uh, Israel has goals that it has to legitimately uh, achieve. And yes, if you want to bring only the hostages, you don't care about what will happen 
with Hamas in the future, then you can surrender to Hamas, bring the hostages, and allow Hamas to rearm and regroup. Mm -hmm. We are not going to allow that, and this is a consensus in the state of Israel. The public doesn't want the government to surrender to Hamas. Does that also include the families of the hostages? Well, you know, we don't have any criticism to the families. Of course, that any family of uh, hostages would uh, do whatever possible in the world in order to bring their dear ones back. At the end of the day, the leaders of Israel have to make a strategic decision, and uh, it's not an easy decision. But they have been protesting against Mr. Netanyahu's government virtually every week, saying he's not doing enough to bring their loved ones back. How would you speak to that? Well, you know, we are a democratic country. I think that uh, any, um, any feeling that any individual in Israel has uh, is a legitimate feeling, and they can express themselves freely um, in our environment. That, that's, that's actually very natural. Um, but, but it's not just them. There is tens of thousands of other yeah, folks from civil know. society who've been rallying virtually every week saying that mm -hmm. the prime minister is not doing enough to That's bring right. the hostages back. That's right. This is part of the criticism. At the end of the day, you and know... And you accept that? Well, we accept criticism always because we have to be open to criticism. Uh, as I said, the dilemma is not that simple mm -hmm. because we don't want to be in a situation in which we will surrender to Hamas demands and then face a situation in which Israel will be attacked again and we will have, again, thousands of casualties. And, uh, so if you're saying that Hamas has not got the capability anymore to launch an October 7th style attack, but it's continuing, A, to rescue the hostages, and B, to ensure it cannot regroup, why then have you opened a new front now in the north with Hezbollah? Well, actually, if you would uh, ask me uh, one year ago, I would tell you that if Israel had a big enough army, we would have attacked Hezbollah immediately. Mm -hmm. um, because Hamas, in a completely unprovoked way, launched an attack against northern Israel on the 8th of October. And this is completely illegitimate. Hamas is a terrorist organization, is an arm of Iran. Uh, and, you know, this is not right. We should have retaliated before. But because of our priorities, because of the fact that we wanted to concentrate in defeating the Hamas terror machine, we postponed our retaliation and we tried to mm -hmm. the last 11 months through diplomatic means to get into a ceasefire in the north that will uh, secure the implementation of Resolution 1701 of the Security Council. Unfortunately, Hezbollah is refusing to do that, and therefore we had no choice but to uh, escalate the situation and put pressure on Hezbollah so they actually agree, and the Lebanese government agrees to implement that resolution that would leave only Lebanese army and unifil forces in the border with Israel. But the escalation against Hezbollah happened just last week. It started really with the pager attacks, which happened sometime middle of last week, and then subsequently there have been rocket attacks, airstrikes by Israel. Uh, the Lebanese health ministry says over 450 have died in the airstrikes that happened over the weekend. Uh, when you started the operation against Hamas one year ago, you had Hezbollah not on your radar. So many are saying this is the Israeli government and the Israeli prime minister changing the goalposts. Your goal was to defeat Hamas, which you claim you have done, but now you're changing the goalposts because you don't want peace, you don't want a ceasefire. Well, uh, this would be a, wrong, a misinterpretation of the situation because, Hamas, uh, because Hezbollah has been firing towards Israel for the last year and we did whatever we could in order to create a situation in which we have a diplomatic solution. Now that we have the capability to actually retaliate in a more massive way, what we have failed to do diplomatically, we are trying to do militarily. Now, you have to understand that this is very important. Hezbollah has embedded, since 2006, tens of thousands of rockets in civilian homes in southern Lebanon and in other parts of Lebanon. We know that for a fact. We have shown evidence to that. And we have called, and our Prime Minister himself has called in the last few days, all the civilians that are living in these houses to immediately evacuate those places because we don't want to harm civilians. If you look at the footage of what Israel targeted, you could see that in many places that we targeted, you had a lot of secondary explosions. And that means that we are actually targeting the military capabilities of Hezbollah. And but we are how, not can, how can you, Ambassador, say uh, civilians. that civilians have to leave? You did the same thing in, in Gaza, asking civilians to leave before the operation launched. But the civilians there, admittedly by your own admission, are 
you know, bound to a terrorist organization, whether it's Hamas in Gaza or Hezbollah in uh, southern Lebanon? How can, how can they leave? How can civilians who are bound by these terrorist organizations possibly leave? Well, first of all, uh, not all civilians are listening to the terrorists. Uh, I think we had a, a challenge in the Gaza Strip that was twofold. The first is that the Gaza Strip is very small and people uh, couldn't evacuate too far. We had to designate humanitarian areas to which uh, civilians could, could uh, safely go. And also Hamas was trying to prevent civilians from leaving. They were actually at gunpoint trying to uh, make them remain because they used them as human shields. In the Lebanese scenario, we're seeing a completely different situation. We're seeing hundreds of thousands of people actually leaving southern Lebanon mm -hmm. uh, to the north. Uh, I think that's a good thing because we, we need, at least temporarily, to have a situation in which all these military installations are evacuated so we can target them. So uh, this is not the same scenario. And again, it is the responsibility of those who want to use human shields and not the responsibility of Israel. Israel actually is going out of its way to try to put civilians out of harm's way. We've been doing this with a, a huge number of tactics that we are using that were never used before through telephone message texts, through by getting, uh, sending radio tests, by flyers, many, many ways. So the civilians have it clear. I think that maybe the reason why many people in South Lebanon are now evacuating fast is because they saw what happened in the Gaza Strip. How, how are you so confident that you can defeat Hezbollah militarily? Uh, you went in in 2006 and you were not able to. So what's changed in the last Well, the years? question is always when you are a democracy, Zaka, is what is the right amount of force that you need to use in order to uh, restore stability? This is not a matter, this is not a football match in which you have to uh, defeat your enemy uh, in any case. You just have to use enough force in order to create a situation in which your enemy or the ones that wants to harm you will stop doing that. It will be deterred from you doing that. So, explain, so this is what we want to explain achieve. Explain this to me in, in, in layman's language. Yes. So your strategy here is to bomb southern Lebanon, is to bomb Hezbollah and its uh, hideouts or whatever, uh, to the extent that they will be afraid of attacking or retaliating back to Israel? Well, this back is, at Israel? Yeah, in one word, it's called deterrence, okay? It's called respecting international law. So Lebanon, that was hijacked by Hezbollah, is being used as a platform to attack Israel. If Hezbollah doesn't stop attacking Israel, it will pay a price. Now, how much, what, what will be the, the, the amount of that price? It's completely up to Hezbollah but to decide. But this is a terrorist organization, by your own admission, a terrorist organization that, that came into its very existence it has on its, on its charter the destruction of Israel. How, how, right. how, is, how is deterrence going to work with such an organization? Well, you, we have seen, first of all, you are right. It's much more difficult to deter a terrorist organization than to deter countries. Yes. Uh, second, we have seen in the past that we have gained very long periods of stability as a result of the military actions we took. So it was enough in 2006 to do a very uh, partial operation without, a, day war, yeah. without, day uh, war. without a major invasion of our forces to Lebanon in order to achieve stability for 14 years. Now, the question is, of course, what is the price of the stability? Because we saw that in the last uh, 14 years, 20, almost 20 years since the last war, Hezbollah has accumulated mm -hmm. huge capabilities that actually uh, supersede the, the technological uh, prowess of, of modern nations. And that is because Iran is feeding them with this technology, sending them money, sending them weapons, sending them uh, training. Um, and this is extremely dangerous. You're right. It's very difficult to deal with that. But we don't have any choice. We, if we want to survive, we want to thrive as a country, we have to defend ourselves. And uh, the, we hope that the amount of force that we'll have to use in order to uh, restore stability will be minimal. So but we are the, determined the, to continue until we reach our goal. What's the end game here? You, ha you have said by your own admission you don't think Hamas can launch another October 7th. You are saying you're going to escalate to the point where you think Hezbollah will be deterred. If neither of this happens, then what, this war, these two wars, this two-front war goes on? For, 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 for how long? I mean, Well, it will uh, have to go on as long as required until we achieve the very limited goals that we have put forward. In the north, we want implementation of UN Security Council Resolution 1701. And in the south, we want to bring our hostages back and make sure that Hamas doesn't regroup 
and rearm again. And you don't think that this is in any way the, the criticism against the Israeli government, and particularly the current dispensation, is the war is being kept alive for the prime minister's own political ends to, to ensure that his coalition government <laughs> is in office. It survives. How do you speak to that criticism? Well, I think that whoever says that doesn't understand the dynamic of uh, the Israeli security establishment. Um, you know, we, we are an army of the people. Every citizen, me and myself, I served three years in the army, I was in reserve for several years. We all serve, and the, the heads of the army, and the politicians, and the people that sit in the security cabinet, not only that they don't take into consideration political uh, objectives, they cannot do that, because they have to discuss the merits of the military operation and the goals of the military operation, so at no time in the discussions that are taking at the highest level of government, mm -hmm. anybody can introduce a political uh, factor. You know, Israel at the end of the day has the elections every four years, and if somebody is not uh, satisfied, they can either you know, go and, and demonstrate or they can elect another government. And this is exactly uh, the dynamic that is going to um, uh, so, so I, do, I do want to ask you, since you mentioned democracies, uh, yesterday Prime Minister Modi was at the UNGA on the sidelines mm -hmm. of the UNGA. He met with uh, Prime Minister Abbas of mm -hmm. uh, the Palestinian Authority and he said that uh, there is a need for an immediate return to the ceasefire. He also reiterated India's long-held position of uh, the two-state solution being the only solution to mm -hmm. this problem. How would you speak to what the Indian government and the Indian Prime Minister have said? Well, I think it's very natural uh, that any person that uh, loves peace and wants stability will, uh, will seek an end to this war. We are also trying to seek an end to this war. Uh, but we have to do it in accordance to uh, our security interests. Um, now, when it comes to uh, uh, the vision of two states, it's good to have a vision. The question is what is, what is the practical way to getting there. Today, unfortunately, if that vision would be implemented immediately, that would mean that you would, had, you would have a Hamas terror state in, the, in Gaza and the West Bank. And that would be uh, a recipe for perpetual war. So if you want to change that, and Israelis want self-rule for the Palestinians, actually throughout the last few decades we gave very generous offers for establishing a Palestinian state. These were rejected by the Palestinians. So we have to be in a situation that not only the, the Hamas and the terrorists are defeated, but the, the region around us is not controlled by radical elements. Do you what believe India can play an honest mediator to try and find a ceasefire between Israel and Palestine? Well, it's completely up to India to decide what role it wants to have. I think that right now it's not a matter of who is going to be the mediator. It's about the merits of the situation. Okay? You have a situation in the Middle East in which you have powers like Iran that are theocratic and radical, you have uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, you have Salafi forces, you have ISIS, Al-Qaeda. This is a very, very uh, precarious envir environment, and we are trying to work together with our pragmatic neighbors. We have a common interest to uh, create stability by confronting these radicals. We have seen during this war uh, a, a situation in which our coordination through the American umbrella of CENTCOM mm -hmm. has uh, created uh, cooperation in order to defend the skies of the Middle East, and this unprecedented attack of Iran, of a barrage of 300 uh, drones and missiles and ballistic missiles, yeah. was successfully foiled. And this is yeah. thanks to this cooperation. So if we have a building block of security cooperation, and we have a political order, a political interest between pragmatic countries after this war, I'm sure that we'll be able to cope with this and even build a building block of economic cooperation. Right. This is what we want to achieve. And I think India can be and has the interest of being part of that security and stability and prosperity corridor that will connect Asia to Europe. To the Middle East. All right. Thank you very much.